Hello. Well, this is nice. The first episode of a second series of Fresh Ears, the podcast where we break apart branded podcasts one by one with the client and the producer to see what we can glean for anyone else thinking about doing the same thing. You may have gathered by the fact that we're back for a second series that we've been busy making more branded podcasts, and you'd be absolutely right. The podcasting world continues to grow and quickly, and as part of that, many brands want to harness the power of audio to tell their stories or their customer stories, or indeed any other stories that they reckon will engage and entertain their target audience. So we're kicking off this series with one of the clients we started working with in 2020, an engineering giant, ABB. If you've not heard of ABB, you're excused, but they make giant infrastructure projects, motors, generators, and most excitingly, robots. We all know robots are sexy, so we worked with ABB to create the Robot Podcast. We were able to model their factory line offline without touching anything, without even being on site, doing a whole modeling. So basically you help the customers without even putting a foot on the ground there and doing the whole simulation, you know, digitally. And if you, you Hang on, Sammy. That. You say this like <laughs> it's just you're like something you do every day. This is mind blowing. So you've recreated a, a virtual twin of a factory and the systems that that factory uses so you can basically remotely operate that factory without ever stepping foot within that factory. Yes, we can We can remotely model, but don't remotely operate because we leave the operation for the customer, but also for safety reasons, but we can model the factory offline. So why would a cutting-edge robot manufacturer want to make a podcast And how do you balance the needs to create something that entertains for the ordinary listener, as well as the, frankly, robot nerds? Mark Mustard is the Global Head of Content for Robotics at ABB. Hello, Mark. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. And Izzy Clark is our senior producer here at Fresh Air, who, alongside producer Georgia Mills, created the Robot Podcast. Hi, Izzy. Hiya. And later we'll be talking to Richard Blake, who is Fresh Air's very own in-house marketing and strategy guru. So, Mark, let's start with you as the client. You came to us already with the intention of making a podcast. What made you think that creating a podcast was the right thing to do for ABB? Yeah, I mean, on a personal level, I love podcasts. I consume probably about eight a week, mostly on stuff like Scottish football or history. I love the format. I love the richness of the content. And robotics is such a like a diverse and rangy subject that the only way you can really articulate it is by having people voice their opinions and their experiences on, on a sort of one-to-one basis. So it, 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 for me, podcasts made perfect sense. You know, you, if you're trying to explain a multifaceted, complex subject to, to an audience, then you can get it straight from the horse's mouth, as it were. And we had uh, a good, good hit rate with some really interesting people from the world of academia, roboticists, to, to come along and supplement what the ABB people were saying. So what did you actually want it to do? What did you want to achieve as a series? What were the objectives behind it? Yeah, we wanted to bring the subject to a sort of wider audience because I think a lot of people, when they think robots, they think, well, oh, you know, Terminator sent from the future to kill John Connor. They think... They're going to take my job. Quite a lot of the, the connotations are negative, but when you actually get into it, it's such a, a fascinating and sort of liberating technology that I wanted to make sure people, as many people as possible, understood that robots are a, a force for good and actually they're going to make work and, and life better for all of us by you know removing people from dangerous situations, from repetitive, boring jobs. That was the sort of key thing that I was trying to get across that they're not to be feared they're to be to be welcomed we talked earlier about two separate audiences you've got a sort of interested member of the public and I use the term nerds which is probably very derogatory what is that target audience as as head of comms who are you normally trying to talk to with whatever content you create around robots yeah I mean it's largely b2b so it's largely people who are decision makers and would 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 decide whether or not to buy a robot or a cobot or automate their processes i suppose they're the peak of the pyramid but 
any any sort of engaged, interested party, really, you know, from students at university studying mechanical engineering or thinking, well, what am I going to do when this is all over? Robotics might be for them. Even just wired readers, people who are interested in how things work and how things get from factories to your doormat, you know. It, I mean, I appreciate that not everybody's going to want to listen to a, a podcast about robotics. It's not for everybody, but, you know, if you're an engineer, if you're a sort of science or a, a mechang student, or even, you know, like I say, a, a decision maker within within an industry, I'd hope there's something in there for you. So quite wide, kind of B2B, kind of B2C, kind of a bit of both, really. So Izzy, as the producer on this, I mean, you've got a, a science background, so... That's why we brought you in on it, apart from anything else. But this is an interesting challenge. So can you perhaps just quickly sum up what the format of the program was for those who haven't heard it? Yeah, so it's a panel show, essentially. So we split that up into three parts. We'd have our introduction where we'd have two experts, one being from ABB and another, you know, either academic or journalist join in to take us through the beginnings of the topic whatever that was they they talk about that topic and some of the robotics that you might know behind it but it's sort of ground level and we build up from there so then part two of that moves on to a case study and that was the nice thing about working with ABB they have quite a varied group of clients so we were able to go to some of them and say hey, can you talk about robots working for your company and how are you using them and and why is that a good solution for you? So we had those personal stories, which I think is important when you're talking about science and robotics, because I think that those personal stories can get lost in science programmes. And then the third part was a bit of future gazing and looking at the challenges of the industry, you know, what needs to be done to make this better? Where can we see this technology heading? Um, what are our experts excited for in the future? So we have that sort of full journey of where we are now, how are we using it, and where could this go? So is it a case of sort of starting small and and moving out from there? Is that the... Is that the approach? Yeah, absolutely. Because you can't just dive in and say like, oh, we're going to be talking about cobots. They're doing this, they're doing that. You really have to paint the picture. Okay, this is a cobot. This is what they do. This is how they work. So that regardless of your listener, you know, whether that is someone who's enthusiastic about technology and robotics or whether they're actually working in that industry, regardless of your listener's experience, everyone starts from that that ground level, has a basic understanding so that when the episode starts to unravel and bring in a few more complex ideas that they're completely there with you and they know what you're talking about. So the presenter is a big part of that as well. We often talk about the presenter as being the voice of the listener and and asking the questions on the listener's behalf. Mark, we went with Fran Scott as presenter, who's an engineer, TV scientist, science presenter. Why was she the right choice, do you think? She knows about techie stuff, right? So it's not it's not new to her. And a lot of the phrases that were being used by the guests, Fran was cognizant of and could ask them to take a step back and you know explain it to the audience because we you know didn't want any any language used that just blocked people. But she she's got an enthusiasm and she has a sort of almost like a, a sort of wide eyed like uh, optimism and enthusiasm for for the whole thing. So Fran was just so disarming and so kind of honest that everybody just got got on with her immediately and everybody kind of just said, right, okay, well, I get it now, you know? And she, if there were any nerves or any sort of, if people were a little bit hesitant, that that quickly faded away. So I thought she was great in that regard. So Izzy, take us through that a little bit, because I think we talk to clients quite a lot about research calls and preparation and how important that is. And, And lots of people think they can, because they're experts in their topic, they can just turn the microphone on and talk. And it's it's not that easy. Can you just take us through that a little bit of how your background in journalism helps you to prep both the guests and the presenter? Yeah, so um, I used to work on a Five Live show, which was all about the latest science. So all the time we were constantly looking at papers that were essentially written by experts and we had to communicate that to the public which is quite a tricky thing to do and it, and it's the same with working behind the scenes on ABB as well that you get on the phone with these experts and you almost have to 
I don't want to say quiz them, but you have to pretend that you know nothing about the topic because at the end of the day, you need to make sure that your guests are able to explain all of these complex ideas to a quite a broad audience. So easily things like technical terms can slip in and you have to have that confidence to come in and experience to say, what does that mean? How does that work? So, so there's no assumed knowledge and that means and it gets the expert into that frame of mind of like, oh, OK, I'm I whilst I am speaking with experts on this podcast, I have to make sure that I communicate like I'm talking to the general public, because for a lot of people, these are these are new ideas. And also the beauty of working with Fran as well is that her presenting style is very much with the voice of the listener in mind. So if complex terms do crop up like there was um, a term actuator came up in the conversation about food and instantly Fran was like what does that mean what's an actuator and it's essentially the hand at the end of the robot that manipulates and moves things but you know I I hadn't come across that term that regularly so it's it's important to always have that in mind. And that ties in Mark with what I was going to ask you about next which is the sort of internal selling process that you need to do and bringing not just external experts or you know third parties but people from within your organization most clients want people from within their organization to appear on their own podcast for obvious reasons but you know ABB is a massive place can you talk us through a little bit about the internal selling that you needed to do in order to get this through and how you managed to sort of work within the organization to build momentum and build enthusiasm about the podcast yeah, I think it's it, it's challenging. I mean, okay, so I always say ABB is probably you know one of the biggest companies most people have never heard of. It's I think roughly the same size as, as Samsung to give you give you an idea. You know, hundred or thousand employees around the world. The robotics division is the smallest division of four, and that has ten thousand employees working in you know right around the world. So it's a massive, massive company with a really strong footprint on on every continent so to know who to go to in the first place is tricky uh, and then you have to try and get time in everyone's diary uh, to we're talking about research calls to explain to them what it is we're trying to achieve because there are varying degrees of knowledge podcast maturity in terms of market to market for example and the the the, the global spread of things was challenging but you have to commit to explaining things as clearly and as concisely as possible, the benefits, the audience, what it is we're trying to do, how we're going to promote it, where will you be able to access it. I think increasingly, like, people do get podcasts, you know, I think they do understand and they understand that it's the, the quality and the richness of the content, the, the depth of the the debate that you can have versus pretty much anything else. So I think there was a willingness there. There was an excitement about it. People like to be asked, I think, a lot of the time. I mean, who, who doesn't like to talk about their their pet subject in front of a, in front of a wider audience? I mean, if, if anyone is going to go down the format of having third party people come on board, that's quite imp- that's quite key in getting your internal stakeholders uh, excited too. Dr. Robin M. Murphy. She she was the lady that had done TED talks and stuff. So as soon as you explain to the 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 ABB participant on on that that episode that this was the lady that was going to participate, they're like, oh wow, you know, I've heard of her. She's great. Uh, I watched her TED talk. So you know, if you can if you can get a high caliber of third party, great host, you know, good production team that can bring it all together and make everybody feel comfortable, I think it it becomes much easier. I'm not going to lie to you. You know, getting getting time in people's diaries is a perennial challenge things happen you know meetings get put in last minute so it is a bit like herding cats it was a bit like herding cats at times but we got there in the end remote recording has made this so much easier in the last 12 months it's been a real you know obviously like like everybody we wondered what impact lockdown would have but actually moving into remote recording and and making sure that we can record with any guest wherever they are actually makes that side of things much easier because we're not asking Sammy to take two, three hours out of his day to go to a studio. We're saying, get a laptop and a phone and we'll have you for half an hour. It makes such a difference. Izzy, have you found that this year that it's just that availability of people has changed, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And it also means that you 
suddenly the range of who you can have on a podcast completely changes. And if anything, that makes it really exciting because some of the logistics of, okay, they're based on the other side of the world. We're working with lots of different time zones. You know, how can we get a studio and get that to work? Whereas if you're just asking for a couple of hours of someone's time and they can do that at home or whatever and we'll just make it work for them then yeah it's completely changed the range of people that we can get well, i can see that we might bring hosts back into studio as routine but not guests really at all i i, I can't see that coming back mark before we just move off the topic of sort of working within such a, a massive organization we've talked about the front end and, and getting guests talk us through a little bit of the sign off process so once once it's made once it's ready were you able to keep a certain amount of autonomy within the organization or did you have lots of layers of stakeholders to talk to to get it signed off yeah well because it was sort of virgin territory for for abb it was fairly straightforward and i, I think that also speaks to the quality of the the first drafts that were coming across you know the the edit was really good. I don't remember going back particularly with, with, with any major changes. But the, the the real benefit of that is that it instills a confidence in the people above you. So my boss reports into the big boss. You know, he was he was getting these things and just really enjoying them straight away. So I mean that's a real skill, taking sometimes a two hour conversation and distilling it down into Ours were about 25 or 27 minutes typically with a little insert in the middle from the customer. So you're talking, you know, an hour and a half down to essentially 20 minutes when you take out all the, the little stings and the eye dents and everything. So, yeah, it, it, it's it, I think for the participants at the time, they kind of think, wow, that's a long thing. Is that, is that going to be an hour and a half podcast? And of course, obviously, it's not. But when you when you distill it down, it becomes really really punchy. It's not a huge time commitment. It's it's fairly straightforward. It's kind of enjoyable as well. It's it's different. It's not another, it's not another PowerPoint. It's not another presentation. So very good to know. You know, it's obviously a worry working with a client of of a really large scale that there are going to be these layers. And and we've worked with obviously fairly bureaucratic organisations. But yeah, it was really heartening and good to know that there was a direct line with you. I mean, it's kind of one of those things, you only get one chance to make a first impression, don't you? And my job as the sort of intermediary between an agency, in this example, Fresh Air, and my boss, my key stakeholder, is to make sure that the the flow and that the quality of the stuff that's getting to him is, is, is the right quality. And sometimes with agencies that works and sometimes it doesn't. And there's a huge amount of trust from, from me to you or me to Izzy to get that right, you know, pretty much first time. I think, you know, maybe a bit of back and forth between the two of us, but fundamentally you need to know that when it's coming over a week out, because a week's not a long time in the in the corporate world, right? It's a very short period of time in the corporate world. But yeah, it, it worked and, it, and, you know, it's it's really reassuring and it's, from my point of view, makes life, you know, a hundred times more um, relaxing. Okay, so Richard Blake is our Head of Marketing and Growth. He's joined us too now. Hello, Rich. Hello. How is everybody? Yeah, good, thank you. So your job within Fresh Air is to help our clients get the podcast in front of the target audience, help grow the profile of the series. And you worked on the robot podcast right from the start. So we've discussed that there were two different audiences. You've got your robot nerds, for want of a better phrase, people who are interested in the industry and perhaps already engaged in the industry. And then you've got a second audience who are general population who is sort of browsing for science content or just interested in, in robots full stop. So how, as a marketeer, do you try and hit those two audiences with the same content? We just try to balance it, really. So um, we had a decent amount of budget that we were able to play around with um, two core channels. So we used ACAST as our kind of our reach channel for that general population you were just talking about. So we targeted a few really key science podcasts. So things like Babbage, which was like The Economist podcast, for instance. So we worked with Acast as a, as a way of kind of driving the reach with that general population. And then we used social and LinkedIn as our kind of like robot nerds targeted audience. So, you know, the, always the goal for the robot podcast was to balance that reach in, with things like YouTube and Acast and, you know, distribution and then driving listens and subscribers, which we very much did with our social and some really targeted audiences with your social channels. It's quite a common thing, that, isn't it? A client wanting to reach 
two different types of audiences because any brand has got people who are already engaged with them and already follow what they do but obviously the point of any piece of content is to bring in a, a wider audience so that's that's a fairly common brief for you isn't it yeah absolutely in the end it's about priorities it's like what's the overall goal for your podcast is it about depth of engagement or is it about reaching as many people as you want and you know how does it fit into as part of your overall content strategy for me podcasts are all about engagement it's about a really immersive listen people are spending hours with your brand and it needs to reflect that so on this particular campaign for the robot podcast we had fran scott who is a brilliant presenter is already in the science space she's well known as a science presenter so how did she play into that strategy I mean, Fran was a dream presenter for us to have, actually. I mean, she was she's fantastic talent to work with. She was really, really behind the podcast, which really helped. And so what we did with her was we created these kind of cool little kind of um, Instagram stories with her, sort of speaking to her phone. She had this great little kind of recording set up in our house. And she recorded some fantastic videos for us, introducing each episode of the podcast. So she she was a you know our core bit of video content that we used across all the different social assets we produced with our production company partner. It just brought it to life and really brought that kind of personal perspective, which is exactly what you want with a podcast because in the end it it needs to feel like it's from the presenter and from the talent. You mentioned the production partner of Foxtrot Papo. Let's give them a bit of a shout out because they were great and video and visuals are just playing more and more of a role in promoting a podcast, aren't they? Absolutely. And it's again, it's about distributing your podcast in the way that you want to. And in the end, it's it's absolutely gold content that you want to distribute and maximise across all your different channels. And Foxtrot Papa were brilliant at turning some footage and that podcast into some really compelling, beautifully looking, it looked great on your phone video that we then were able to distribute using paid and organic. Yeah, they were really good production partners, actually. They were really on it. They were always delivering on time. And they had to deal with some, you know, some sidebars and some changes as we went through. But they were always on it, always delivering. Jacob Foxtrot Papa deserves a huge amount of credit. He really delivered for us. And I, I think it's, it sets a good model for us to work on sort of video assets going forward. It's a really great way of distributing any podcast content. So, Mark, just to reflect on that marketing strategy that we put in was there a particular angle that you felt worked in shouting about the podcast was there a particular route that we used that you thought was more effective than others yeah i mean i think again rich was rich was super helpful insofar as he was suggesting the sort of types of content that we could produce to go along with the with the podcast so little um video vignettes and audio files and stuff that we could use to promote on social they've gone absolutely gangbusters i mean the the trail for the episode has had over two million views on on youtube right so it's the most viewed piece of content that abb robotics has ever done and then we gave that to our media agency and they leveraged those when they were when they were buying buying space so yeah you know that was a real sort of holistic approach that I think has helped to make it the success that it's been. So finally from you then, Rich, what, as you look back on series one of the Robot Podcast, what worked best, what didn't work, what lessons have you taken from it? I think the internal engagement that Mark was able to create out of the Robot Podcast was actually really strong. And I think it had a very, very clear editorial line. It's about robots. It's about getting really geeky with robots. And, you know, that was a, that was a great start to have. It was a really distinctive piece. So I was really pleased with the launch. We had a very clear audience breakdown. I think what I want to change is in how we drive engagement throughout the series, so how we drive content and how we use paid social better. We haven't quite cracked it with the robot podcast yet on paid social. Did a brilliant job in terms of distribution. So how we measure that better, how we drive much more effective use of paid social would be my priority. And also just, yeah, just driving that community feel as well. With season two, we're going to start to feel like there's a real set format. It feels like it's part of a community. So how we drive that community piece across the across season two, I think, would be important. Brilliant. Thank you, Rich. So Mark and Izzy, we've hinted at season two coming up. It's actually already in production. So just before we finish, let's hear from both of you about what would you change? How is season two going to be different from season one? And what lessons have you learned from here? I mean, obviously, there's little there's little bits that we'll, we'll we'll tweak and we'll amend. But I think the fundamental advantage that we have for season two over season one is that we now have a tangible thing that we can share with people. So when you know Izzy and George it makes it, such a difference, that doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. You know, don't don't 
don't tell me you're funny, make me laugh, right? So it's kind of like, yeah, this is the robot podcast. This is the quality. This is the sort of, you know, give or take listener numbers that we get per episode. It's, it's worthwhile you participating in a piece of quality content of this standard, you know? And that becomes a much easier sell for Georgia and Izzy. It becomes a much easier thing for me to do internally because, well, everybody's heard of it. Everybody's listened to it internally. I've got people coming to me now saying, I'd love to do an episode, please, on this subject. I've got something really interesting to say. So I'm I'm kind of hoping that the whole process is even smoother than it was last time and that we can use the extra time that that affords us to, to really nail the format and make sure that the, the subject matter is super interesting. Izzy? What would you do differently or what will you do differently in series two? I think we've learned because of everyone's very busy schedules, I'm working with different time zones to give it a longer run up. Just to deal with one, getting those research calls done and also building the show more around that. There is talk of maybe tweaking the format ever so slightly so that we actually tip it more into the balance of the consumer at the very beginning. So the first thing that you hear is a really interesting everyday application of robotics or something that really just completely grips you and makes you sit up and listen. And we talk about how that's being used in everyday subjects and then move into industry and break it up a little bit more just so that we make sure that we're really appealing to those who are the tech enthusiasts and it's just an interesting you know it's just an robotics is cool just giving that it's full time at the beginning I think is probably what we'll do. How much difference does it make to you as a producer that you've just got to know the organisation now that you you understand how Mark works you understand the culture of ABB how much difference does that make to what you do? Oh, it's it's it makes a huge difference, and it's been great to like work with Mark, who is the quickest person to respond to an email ever. So if, even if you have a question, <laughs> you get the get a response instantly. Or there's very much a working relationship where you can say, "Oh, we're thinking about doing this. What, like, what about this topic?" And there, it's that open conversation of back and forth of what is best for the podcast. And I think that makes it, you know, much more interesting listen. You have to commit though, don't you? You can't just be passive. You're the client, whatever, but you can't be passive in it. You have to be involved. And, you know, I've worked in agencies myself and I've had good clients and I've had bad clients. And uh, you only get out what you put in. If you're considering doing one of these things, there is a big time commitment on your side as the client. That's justifiable, I think, because the the quality of the output is only is is entirely reflective of your commitment to the project. If you, you know, think you can just hand this off to two people who don't work inside your organisation and they're going to go and make it happen, well, yeah, they will, but it won't be as good as if you were a hundred percent engaged. And I, it, honestly, I just, it was enjoyable. It's great fun. It's it's nice to bring something like this to life, you know. And it it'll be it's there forever, you know. It, have an opinion, you know. Be be quick because these things move quick and you're trying to get time in five different people's diaries to make this stuff happen and that's difficult right that's that's the hardest part you know you got to, the stars have got to align and you can't just be you, know, you can't take a week to respond to your producer in that in that instance you've got to be more on it than that brilliant i was going to ask you for any tips mark for other people who are doing the same thing but that was a gigantic brilliant tip is, is there anything else that you would pass on to anybody else who was looking at doing a similar sort of project or have we covered it all you have to have a vision, right? Like you have to have a, a reason for doing it and you'll get pushed and you'll get pulled by the organization. There'll be people who have vested interest and they want to do certain things, certain ways. They want to add this, take that out, you know, multiply it by X. Stick, stick to your vision, stick to the reason you want to do it in the first place. What was the, what was the reason you picked up the phone to, to, to Neil or Michaela, right? What, what, why did you want to do a podcast and stick to it? Because, you know, you're going to get people trying to pull you in different directions, but if it was a good idea at the offset, it's a good idea now. And, and, and just, you know, be strong, be committed to, to, to the reason for doing it. Because you could quite easily, the, the, the big problem with big organisations is things, you know, it's a death, death by a thousand cuts. It starts off as one thing and it gets pulled in 12 different directions and ends up as something completely different. And then no one's happy. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody. For those who would like to hear the Robot Podcast, have a look on Spotify, on Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you very much to Mark Mustard, the Global Head of Content for Robotics at ABB, Izzy Clark, Senior Producer here at Fresh Air, and Richard Blake, Fresh Air's Head of Marketing and Growth. If you'd like to find out how Fresh Air can make a fantastic podcast for your brand, please do get in touch with us at freshairproduction.co.uk. In the meantime, I'm Neil Kaling. Thank you very much for listening. Fresh Air.